Western Christianity has spent the last 2,000 years telling everyone they're separated from God. This is Not Church with John and Nat Turney. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Nat Turney. With me, as always, is my brother, John, uh, sequestered as he is in the uh, in the, the the majestic mountains of Northern California, surrounded on all sides by cattle and weed. Say hi, John. <laughs> Hi, John. <laughs> is that is that a fair assessment? Surrounded, you're ensconced, as it were, amongst the cattle wrong. farmers and the weed farmers. So you know, you're, you're not wrong. I'm out here in the middle of uh, of, of flat brown West Texas. Uh, we are, man. I tell you what, I'm. I'm. If I sound a little giddy, it's because I'm a little giddy. Our guest today is a guy that um, I just respect the hell out of. Um, somebody whose scholarship I followed for quite some time. And who had a major role, um, who has had a major role in my spiritual formation in the last probably two or three decades. So let me just get to introducing him. Then we're going to just see where, where everything takes us. So with us today is John Dominic Croson. He is pro- a professor emeritus of religious studies at DePaul University in Chicago. He's written 20 books on the historical Jesus in the last 30 years, four of which have become national religious bestsellers. Um, the historical Jesus in 90, 1991. Jesus, a revolutionary biography in 94, who killed Jesus in 95, and the birth of Christianity in 1998. He is a former co-chair of the Jesus Seminar and a former chair of the historical Jesus section of the Society of Biblical Literature, an international scholarly association for biblical study based in the United States. He is also the author of a brand new book called Render Unto Caesar, um, which is going to just be awesome. I, I, I will honestly say up front, I've read about a third of it, and it's just Partly because it's just dense, man. There's so much good stuff in there. I don't want to rush through it. So um, I plan to finish reading that as soon as we get done with this conversation. But one of my heroes of the faith, man, I, uh, John, or can we call you Dom? Uh, yeah, Dom. yeah, Dom. I, I saw Dom. that too. When we were starting, you had a mug even that says, it said on one side, it said Dom 2022. Is that what it was? This is from my wife. <laughs> I love it. So on the one side is the cover of the book, right? Yeah, and on the other side it has your name, right? It just says D- yeah, Dom twenty twenty two. Dom twenty twenty two. So we can we can refer to you as sort of like the the Godfather of the of of the historical Jesus movement. Yeah, he's the Dom. So <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and again, we're glad you're here. Um, we asked this of all of our guests, and I know that asking somebody of your stature um, this question might might yield more results than we want. Um, but we typically like to start asking people about you know sort of their faith journey. I, su- I suspect that could that could take us far back, but um, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of give us an idea of 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 your experience with faith and and how it shaped you or whatever, how, however that that feels right to you. Oh yeah, I I grew up in Ireland, of course, where it, you know faith was taken for granted. If you're a Roman Catholic, I was in the Republic, of course, of Ireland, so faith never came up the way it might come up in a say in a city or a or a town in here where you have all the different, <laughs> you know the vision of Christianity all down right. the street. We were Roman Catholic. What's that? It's the wallpaper of the, the country. So, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, you know, don't think of it as a crisis. Or anything. That's just what I took for granted. The, the big difference is, of course, that um, I wasn't battered by fundamentalism, at least by mm. biblical fundamentalism. There was papal fundamentalism, but that was over in Italy and the Irish never Heated that in any case, so <laughs> that wasn't a problem. But I did spend, you know, 19 years in a Roman Catholic monastery and 12 priest. And the reason I left, actually, was primarily because they had trained me extremely well to be a thinking scholar. And I ran into serious trouble, not with my order, by the way. Let me insist on that, not with my order. The orders protect their members like a family does. But I had a kind of a run-in with the... Cardinal Cody, the Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago. This goes back to 68, by the papal encyclical. I said, the Pope is wrong. I said, you know, that happens. He didn't think that was appropriate. (laughs) So when the dust dust settled, he was still the Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago, and I was the next priest. (laughs) I had had decided, okay, uh, this is not going to work. So I applied officially and politely for a dispensation from Rome. And I think they rather hurriedly sent me one. <laughs> I think they were rather glad to say goodbye. So, but that, none of that touched, you know, touched my faith. I, I mean, it's, you can disagree very much with your, with your president, for example, which still not, still believe in democracy. So yeah. I, I never thought that this 
touched anywhere close to my faith. This was about institution and government and, you know, careerism and strategy. So my faith was in Christianity. <laughs> it never was in the Pope. It was, it was in Jesus as the Christ. So that has never been touched. Anything I, I have done has done nothing more than strengthen it, make it more sensible, help me distinguish between, say, religion and superstition, which sometimes I don't think people can understand the difference. And the difference for me is that I have also a reasonable explanation of my faith. You can have faith and say, well, it's beyond reason. I just have it and that's the way it is. Fine. I don't know then how you tell that from superstition. But the way I judge superstition from religion is that religion has to be able to be presented to opponents even or to onlookers as a reasonable position. Okay. Not necessarily one you might agree with, but <laughs> we have reasonable positions and all sorts of things that other people disagree with, but we still think they're reasonable. Sure. So that's been basically a fast resume of my journey. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just love it. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm in love with the way you're putting all of this. Um, so that, that idea that, that, that religion should be presented first and foremost as reasonable on some level. I like that because that takes some of the subjectivity out of it. And I like, you know, I made that same parallel that you just did with them. Um, there are people that I, with whom I vehemently disagree but who I would still say, but I understand how you got there. Yeah. Like exactly. I understand, yeah. I mean, I don't like, I don't, I don't agree with how you are, yeah. or, or where yeah. you arrived necessarily, but I, oh, I can see, I can see that. So that differentiation is good. When I was in the seminary, uh, training to be a priest and as a monk, we spent hours studying Thomas Aquinas and, you know, 13th century Thomas Aquinas. We were a 13th century order. And, you know, I imagine he spent the morning studying Aristotle, which was more or less, let's say, reason. Then he had lost, had a nap, I'm sure, because he was a, a, a monk. And then he spent the afternoon, let's say, doing theology. And what I observed from all of that is it never occurred to him that there was any really contradiction between reason and revelation. Mm. He thought they both came from God. And if there was a contradiction, I, he must have got it wrong. Mm. So, I was deeply immersed in that because of coming from a 13th century order and spending, you know, 19 years in that order. And it didn't occur to me as a great big, what would I call it, achievement. I, I kind of took it for granted. Of course, it had, it, reason and revelation have to be in a, a sort of a, a dance together. Yeah. And maybe until which is which, but I took that for granted in a way I honestly, until I came to this country, I came here in 1951 as a student. Um, I'm the Queen Mayor, even it used to move, by the way. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> now it's out in California at Long Beach yeah. and it doesn't move anymore. It just sits there, but so, I've, I've actually been on that. <laughs> Do you? It was probably in 51, came yeah. over and actually cabin class, second class on the Queen Mary. It was heavenly. Wow. It was lovely. Yeah. <laughs> but but it, it, it's so deeply embedded in me that I, I don't think of it as any sort of an achievement, if you know what I mean. I took it for granted. Yeah. And that had to do with my education. I, I could have had a different education. Yeah. But having been born and raised in Ireland, you said as though, you know, like you mentioned in the very beginning, that you, you took religion. faith for granted. Yeah. It was just a given. Um, your religion for granted. Um, so, but do you think that the Irish, John and I are Irish by blood. We've never been to Ireland. I plan to go someday. But do you, do you feel like that Irish approach to life sort of inculcated you. It's like colored how you would see faith and religion then too. Like you, you said you didn't have any sort of fundamentalist um, trappings to get rid of because, you know, that, that wasn't kind of the way that y'all approached faith, right? Yeah, it really wasn't. I had to really kind of learn about it when I came over here. And even in the Jesus seminar, I had to learn that why this was a problem for people. I, I, I didn't get it. I really didn't get it for a while. But, because I, I didn't know about it. I, I just knew people wanted to know about Jesus. Sure, I'd like to know about Jesus. It sounded to make sense to me. Historical Jesus, would we, what would you know about him from reason? Then you can make up your own mind. Yeah. If you think he was a jerk or, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, you, you know, I, I could learn everything about Jesus and say, this guy is really nuts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think the Romans got it right. They got rid of him as fast as they could. It's a danger to law and order. I mean, that's after all the way Pilate judged it. Yeah. So when I was studying the historical Jesus, I was kind of thinking of myself a bit like a journalist. You know, I want to know 
why this guy had some people who wanted him crucified and some people who wanted him divinized. And how can you get both of that out of the same person? So I figured if you couldn't explain both those things, you didn't have them. Right. Then at that stage, then of course, like with anyone else, you had to make your decision. Do I think he is saying something important? Not just for my life, to honestly, but for the life of the world. If he's not saying something important for the life of the world, and it's just a little personal, you know, something for me, that's sweet and that's nice. But I, I thought he, he thought he was speaking to the world. He thought. So if I was going to acknowledge him seriously, I had to say he's either deluded that he has a message, a message for the world. Nice guy, maybe, but you know, was, <laughs> was a bit overwrought on that. Or, yeah, I think he does have a message for the world. And if that's true, then it's true now. So that's what I really had to face. So that's where faith comes in. Yeah. But faith comes in after you've decided that this is the challenge, as it were. And now I have to decide on it. Right. But we don't necessarily, and that's the thing, I think the fundamentalists, and I don't, I don't want to cast a, you know, I don't want to cast them all in the same light, but typically as uh, the problem with fundamentalism for me is that faith gets divorced from reason. Those things don't actually go hand in hand. One has nothing to do with the other, actually. And that's the danger. That's, that's really the danger. Not with everyone. But see, my own situation, I don't want to say it's unique, but I went to a classical boarding school between 1945 and 1955 years. I was 11 when I was in, 16 when I came out. It was, it was a, ordinary boarding school. It took five years of Greek and five years of Latin. Routine. I, I, I wasn't impressed, by the way. <laughs> <That's what laughs> I, wasn't impressed. I wouldn't say, oh, I'm having Latin and Greek. It was just one more thing that you got hit with the cane if you didn't get the conjugations of the clenches right. So anyway. Right. <laughs> but what, what it meant was that I actually, without knowing how important it was, was reading Virgil's Aeneid. I was actually doing it of course, in Latin, but reading Virgil's Aeneid before I ever got to the New Testament. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to make that sound like, ooh, it, I, I was just doing it because everyone in the class was doing the darn thing. And we had to learn, learn this stupid text and, you know, in a weird language. But what it meant for me that in the long haul, when I got to the New Testament and I read Paul, and I, we're talking about well deep in the seminary, I began to see, well, of course, the language that he's speaking here it's not some weird Christian language. That's a counter narrative, a counter language to the language I learned in Virgil's Aeneid. So Roman imperial theology, now I didn't know that term at the time. I really didn't. But Ro the stuff in Virgil, I would have said, Roman imperial theology was the matrix of the world that Paul, for example, lived in. So when he starts talking about weird terms about Jesus being God and Son of God and Savior of the world and Redeemer, I I knew all that language from Latin, you know, in school. So it, it never struck me the way it seems to strike some people as, wow, he's talking about justification. That must mean how do I stand in lonely isolation before God and how can I be justified I knew it was about making a just world because that was the Roman program. Mm. They would have said, Paul, but, but Paul, that's our program. We will take over your country. We will pacify you. You'll be good little boys and girls and not rebel. And then we will have peace, the Pax Romana. And of course, we'd have a just world. Mm. All empires claimed that, of course. We bring you justice, you barbarians. Right. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We bring it with a sword, but okay. With right. A sword. But, you know, don't get picky. You know. Yeah, no, you and, still get peace. <laughs> you won't get killed. It's like you know, it'd be very peaceful. Was, like cemeteries are very peaceful places. Right. You know, for sure. <laughs> very peaceful. Oh man. So would you view? I know there's so many different ways to read Paul. I had never. I guess I hadn't really considered that you could read. You could read Paul in some ways as a polemic. You know, so he's he's providing this counter narrative. He's oh, appropriating sure. terms that that first century people would have absolutely been familiar with, right? Um, yeah, and just, two thousand plus years later, we're still trying to make sense of it. But they would have said, "Oh, he's using Son of God." Um, yeah. That's a term reserved for Caesar. That's a right? term reserved for Caesar. Now, if I'm talking, for example, to a literalist, somebody who takes everything literally, I would simply say, "Please don't cheat." <laughs> 
if you want to take it literally that Caesar was the son of God, and God, by the way, God incarnate, take Caesar literally, and then come along, I'll take Jesus literally. Right. You have, you have high treason in any case, because Jesus is not saying, well, we've got two sons of God here. You know, right. Caesar understood quite well and quite immediately, there's only one son of God. Now, you can ha- all have your little gods and your little lords and your little saviors. And they're fine, that's all lovely. Just don't say you're the savior. So when Paul, for example, talks about our Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord Jesus mm. Christ, that simple term from A to the is called treason. Mm. It'd be like me walking around Washington saying, I am the president. Right. Now, it could be the president of the school board or something like that, nobody cares. But if I go around Washington, I think the Secret Service would immediately want to know, what exactly do you mean? Right. Uh, what What's going on? They would know me, as the Romans did, that if we have a bunch of people, <laughs> weirdos from our Roman point of view, who were talking about their God being the God, and their Lord being the Lord, they want to know about these people, and that's why these people end up crucified or executed. It's not like the Romans did this for their own amusement. So when Jesus talks about the rule of God, the Romans would say, well, that's us, must be talking about us. But wait, he doesn't seem to be talking about us. So they understood exactly the challenge. And now if we're serious, we'd have to say, okay, what's the difference? So Caesar is the son of God, or God, or Redeemer, all these terms, so is Jesus. We have the Pax Romana, we have the Pax Christiana, let me call it. Why do we need two of them? We only got one word. So (laughs) if I'm a Roman aristocrat, I know immediately I don't like this, but I'm trying to might be curious, how on earth can he talk about, you know, bringing peace to the world? We got it already. It's, It's called the Pax Romana. There has to be some kind of an other vision, other idea, other type of peace. I don't know what it is, the Romans might say, but I don't like it. We got a monopoly on it, and you're dead. <laughs> Don't take it personally. <laughs> can, I, can I tell you a story, Dom? You got a second? Of course, go ahead. I don't want to forget to. Not, I don't want to forget to tell you that that my first introduction to you was in college, and so oh, in really? 1997, I was in my senior year at University of Maryland, okay. and um, I was taking a summer course, and I saw this. I saw this course come across my catalog and it was uh, the historical Jesus. And I was like, oh, that sounds good. I'm going to take that class. Now at the time, understand, I'm a, I'm a, full, I'm a fully fledged died in the wool fundamentalist uh, evangelical Christian. I think I'm going to get to go talk about Jesus, you know, like I'm going to church. And you know, um, so, him, really, yeah. <laughs> so the, uh, um, the textbook is yours. Um, it was Jesus, a revolutionary biography. Oh, sure. And I just wanted you to know that, that I, I really didn't like you very much. <laughs> I was like, who is this guy? And then, you know, then of course the, the professor was also using the, the, the five gospels, you know, talking about right. the Jesus seminar. And, you know, so we, uh, we spent the better course of, you know, six weeks or so together of me trying my damnedest to, to, uh, to, to, to argue against this heretical teaching. Um, so fast forward 20 years and you are absolutely hands down one of my favorite people. Um, I've just come to appreciate your work a ton. Um, you've, anyways, I, that, that's, that's more of a, just an amusing story, but also just to illustrate the effect that you can have, um, that you might not even be aware that you've done where you've taken somebody like me on a bit of a journey. Because even though I was not really happy with you at the time, I couldn't get some of that stuff out of my head, um, and I had to reconcile some of the tension of my own. And I like how you how you made that distinction between um, superstition and and faith, or superstition and religion. most of my faith was superstition. It wasn't backed up by any kind of reason. Anyway, so I I I really do appreciate that impact that you've had on me. So. And I'm sure there's others, but I think of those like two sides of the same coin, you know, reason yeah. and revelation. And you, you can't have a one sided coin. <laughs> no. So, I think Hawk, Borges wrote a, wrote a short little story one time about a one sided coin and it, it, dropped, <laughs> it dropped onto the ground the wrong side up and they couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh, oh, man. I I, oh, I I so love it, Miss Marcus Borg, man. I tell you, you brought him up. So let's talk about your, your experiences with him because you guys were both obviously foundational in the Jesus seminar. What was your, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you have a million stories, but what was, what was Marcus truly like? I mean, he seemed like a, like a genuinely good man. But now, let me clarify one thing. That story I was talking about was written by Borges, B-O-R-G-E-S. Oh, I, thought you said Mark, I thought you said Borg. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so, we can talk about that. Okay. I think what was very interesting was that Marcus, uh, Marianne and Marcus Borg invited Sarah and myself in 2000 to say we're going to start doing some pilgrimages in search of Paul every year, take 40 people around Turkey. Are you interested in coming along as co-leaders? And we said, you mean we get to go free and see... Turkey, and they said, yep. And I said, that sounds like a plan. So uh, <laughs> four of us went every year on, until really the end, uh, taking 14 people around Turkey, all, all across. You know, the great thing about Turkey was you can still see so much of Roman imperial theology there. It's a huge country, and it, it didn't get nearly as battered as Israel did with the, you know, the war of 66 to 74 and afterwards. So there's a lot more you can see of background to Paul. I would almost say in Turkey than in Greece even, let alone, let alone Israel. So we went there and basically that was, that was where it was clarified, I think, for both of us, especially after 9-11, taking 40 Americans every year to the ruins of this huge empire. And you could look at the stones and you knew it never thought it was going away. Even in ruins, the giant stones in the ruins of anywhere, any Roman site, said this was built for forever. They didn't think this was just going to be <laughs> the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. So we were also watching Americans getting it after 9-11, after that tragedy, about the dangers of empire and the mortality rate of empires in history. And it... It gives all of them a matrix and a background with which Paul came alive. Marcus one time said to me, are we getting better and better at this? And I said, no, I don't think we're getting better and better. We're just saying the same thing, but the audience is ready at first. Now, that's that's interesting because I, I, I think you're right about that. I do sense that there's the audience is readier, right? That there's there's more of a, at least a desire to to uncover some truth here. Yeah, it was um, a I hope so anyway. experience, honestly. It was formative. Going yeah. back to every year, I mean, you can't do that 15 years or so in a row unless you're getting something every year. Otherwise, you'd be die of boredom, saying the same thing. <laughs> yeah. No, we were always yeah. watching the people's reaction to it. They were always mm. different. So the reactions were always different. And every night we'd, we'd go across, you know, we'd nice big <laughs> air-conditioned bus. So I wasn't traveling like Paul was on, on his feet in the Roman roads. Nice air-conditioned bus. And we give a lecture every night. And when you're in, in the, the venues where Paul was, uh, not just where he was, but where you could see his world most clearly. If you, even if he hadn't gone, say, to Aphrodisias, you could go there and see, this is where you can still see his world. Mm, that's amazing. Wow. So, uh, let, let's, let's talk about the new book in particular. Um, I, I really like the premise of this because to me, it kind of fits with, it, it parallels somewhat the notion that we cannot divorce Jesus from his Jewishness, right? Which I think so much of fundamentalism fails at recognizing the Jewishness of Jesus. And so we turn him into some, you know, we whitewash him and we just all, but, but the premise of, of your book seems to be, we also can't take him out of his Roman context as being part of that Roman world, right? I think since, you know, since after the second world war, the conscience of a lot of Christian exegetes began to realize that we had taken him out of his Jewishness. He was sort of a proto-Christian. I mean, we knew, of course, but he was like a proto-Christian. Then I think it only in the 90s on, people began, began to say, well, it's not enough to say he was a Jew. Of course he was a Jew, but he was a Jew under Romanization. He was in the homeland, but it was under Romanization. And the Roman Empire was like the giant elephant in the room. <laughs> We, we, had, we had to explain Pilate. We knew we were stuck with Pilate because he's in the creed. So <laughs> Pilate had to appear, crucified under sure. 
So where did he come from? You know, did Jesus just run into him or was it bad look? So you really had to say a Jewish person in the Jewish homeland under its initial Romanization. And then you had to focus it even more and say, how did Romanization look in Antipas's Galilee when he was getting with, uh, let me back up. Roman imperialism was not just about grabbing land. Roman imperialism, I would describe as Mediterranean globalization. Now, I don't want to use globalization as if I'm trying to just use a modern term. Their purpose was the economic unity of the Mediterranean in as far as the great rivers like the Danube or the, the, the uh, Rhine and the desert. So, that was what they were interested in, <laughs> globalization. We might laugh and say, come on, it's just the Mediterranean. Yeah, but fine. <laughs> For the moment, that's what they're up to. And in that thing, Israel is important, not primarily because of its wealth or anything like that, but because it links Syria to the north, Egypt to the south. And during the non-sailing system, if you have to move your troops around, <laughs> If the Parthians are coming west, that's where you want to move your troops from Syria and Egypt. So it's important as part of that perimeter. Now, how, how is that doing with the people who believe the land belongs to God? It says so in the Torah. The land belongs to me. You're all tenant farmers and resident aliens. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, that's in the Torah. The land belongs to God. Well, Rome said, excuse me, the land belongs to us. <laughs> we took it from you, and if you want to get theological, our Jupiter took it from your Yahweh, and it's still ours. All right. <laughs> so, no wonder there's going to be, you know, uprisings. But they also, the great interest is that Jesus is in Galilee in the 20s. So was John the Baptist, of course, before him. And this is when Romanization hits the lake, as it were. So if you want to know why there's so much fishy stuff in the Gospels, why all those first, first followers like Mary of Magdala or, or Peter up at Capernaum, why are there so many fishers? Because Antipas, by the year 20, had moved his capital from inland Sepphoris to lakeside Tiberias to commercialize the lake and get with the Roman program. So fish were not just being available for the local peasants who could come down there and grab a fish with their nets or launch a boat. They were being salted fish and dried fish to go into, off the tire, by the way, and into the Roman Mediterranean. So globalization has hit Galilee in its own small way. What Jesus has then is a tradition and a tr and traction. You can't overestimate traction. The tradition of justice and God owns the land, that was there for, prophets have been saying that for 500 years. Well, why was anyone listening particularly to Jesus? Well, what he's saying is, now the kingdom of God is here, and no, this is not right what is happening, and if we join with God, we will make the kingdom happen. Now that's the message. It presumes the traction, of course, of a very specific case. If I am, for example, Mary of Magdala, which was the main fishing village before Tiberius, the city was plunked right down next to it, I know this is not right. This is not fair. This is not just. So all this lovely Torah stuff and prophetic stuff that's all kind of up in the air there comes down now, as Shakespeare said, and gives a local habitation and a name. And that's why many of those first followers are going to be fishers. They know this is not right. So their, their tradition gets traction. And that's what, that's when you get a following. That's when you get a movement. And that's also, of course, when you get killed. Right. <laughs> that's, the of, that's the leader of a movement. But you make also the point that Jesus is, you know, Jesus arrives on the scene as the Roman Empire is is becoming more and more imperial, right? And yes. less and less, like they're they're and they're losing their republic. Right. They're yeah. moving more and more towards um totalitarian autocracy versus anything that resembled, you know, their founding ideologies, right? Of of republic. That's where they 
that's where it's almost impossible for me, having spent so much of my life in the first century and wandering the ruins of Rome and visiting the museums and every year doing this over and over, not to look at the parallels because Rome started off with an autocrat, a king, like we did. Good old George right. III. Theirs was not quite George III. They had a king. <laughs> they decided to get rid of their king, so did we. It took us, I'm Irish, took us much longer to get rid of our king. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to get the dragoons across the Irish Sea than across the Atlantic. Anyway, um, <laughs> we find out the hard way. So, yeah. <laughs> so we get a republic. Rome got a republic. And for a while it worked really well. Then they decided they'd like to get an imperial republic. Now, what, what was to stop Caesar going all the way to Gaul and grabbing France and Pompeii going all the way to Syria and grabbing that? It sounded like a good idea. But then they went to civil war with battle-hardened legions on both sides, just like our civil war. It wasn't just our well-trained soldiers against people with spears and bows and arrows. It was people on both sides with the same weapons. They had the same experience. As they, as their republic started to get imperial, they found they couldn't have it both ways. They couldn't have a republic and an empire. And something had to give. And what gave was, of course, Caesar Augustus, who put an end to the civil war that had gone on for 20 years. Ours was only four, at least. Imagine what 20 years of Roman civil war was like, with legions on both sides. And a lot of their battles were fought in Greece. In Greece, you know. <laughs> they didn't even fight them in Italy. A lot of them were fought in Greece, the main ones. So at the end of that, there was a great sigh of relief across the whole Roman Empire. Peace at last. Thank God. Well, wait a minute. Who are we thanking? We're thanking Caesar, Augustus. But he must be divine. How, how else can we explain it? So it made absolute sense to me to think of Caesar was the manifestation of God on earth, God incarnate, son of God, anything you want to give him. And it helped, of course, that he lived for another 40 years after that. It's, you know, but that all happened to them, and it made absolute sense. And when you look at us, we, I think, were in the process of losing our republic and bringing back an autocrat. And I'm, you know, I'm talking about not just one person. I'm not talking about simply President Trump. I'm talking about Trumpism as what I'm going to call the lust for autocracy. Wouldn't it be much better to have somebody who would tell us what to do and then we, then we'd be much more secure. And it's right. good people can feel that way. Whatever sure. people top me be doing, they feel, well, there's so much going on. I can't know what's going on. Wouldn't we have better to have one person? Rome did it. Rome decided it would be much better to run the empire. We have Caesar Augusta. They were kind of lucky. They could have done much worse. <laughs> no, they right. would they'd get a Caligula. <laughs> They could have had Trump. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. Caesar Augustus was about as good as you're going to get if you're going to get an emperor. And yeah, as far as autocratic dictators go, right? Not too bad. <laughs> his, his official title in Greek is autocrator. That's, mm. we, we put it in Latin as imperator, which right. we can translate as emperor, which, is, which that doesn't help at all. His Greek title is autocrator, the self powerful one, auto, mm. not democrats or oligarch, but he's a self-powerful one. So they got it. And what we have to recognize is that everyone wasn't against it. They really weren't. Millions of people thought this makes sense. In fact, how else do we explain what he's done? He's brought peace from 20 years of savage civil war. He must be divine. And along comes this, this nobody from Nazareth in Galilee. For God's sake, they might have said, and he thinks he's going to bring peace to the world. Now, what Jesus, what Jesus would have said if he ever got into a chat with Augustus Caesar, which I wouldn't advise him to do, he would have said, "No, no, no, your imperial majesty, this is just a law, a law. This isn't peace. It's a law." And he would have said, "I know that because I." The book of Daniel tells me about the, uh, the, the, the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and the Syrians and the Egyptians, and they all come and they all went, and you're just the next one. But each time he might have said, you bring more slaughter, mm. more powerful. 
empires ain't getting weaker. Right. So but he, the mortality rate is 100%, right? The mortality rate is much higher. I mean, we, we <laughs> thought in the book of Daniel that the worst thing they could imagine was the phalanxes of Alexander the Great. And then yeah. they got the legions. So for every, for every greatest iteration of empire, um, there's always the next wave that's coming, right? That, that's what history tells us. Now, I'm not yeah. really prophetic. I'm just looking at a trajectory yeah. that we've never had weapons we didn't use. And we never had weapons that were weaker than the ones that went before. And that's, that's the saga of our species. Yeah. So then we, then we, then we look at this and as history repeats itself, right? And so now we look at this American dream, this American, whatever we want to call nightmare. As we see, I don't think it's too hard to see the demise of democracy in America, the, the scary world we're going into. So with the rise of evangelical fundamentalism in this country, and the need to create a Jesus that's more like Rambo, that's more like John Wayne than a peace. Is this just another version of what we saw in Rome of creating this God who through power and might will bring us peace? Even though we, if you just take a little bit of time, you can see that that's not Jesus's message, but the, the evangelical fundamentalist church seems to have co-opted Jesus and made him into this angry, I'm coming back with a sword, I'm going to destroy the 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 non-believers. Is that just the beginning of this next phase of the of this empire? That's the rather ghastly phase on the one on the one level. And that's why I have to spend so much time in that book on the book of Revelation, because that's what you've just described is exactly what the book of Revelation says. It says, for example, this is its theme and its thesis that Rome has slaughtered Christians in the immediate past and Christ is returning to slaughter Romans in the imminent future. Imminent future, soon, 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 they keep saying. And that may strike a lot of people as well. That's fair enough. They slaughtered us. We want to slaughter them. There's only there's two problems with that. The first one is historical. It just ain't true. Mm. Rome did not slaughter Christians. As a as an imperial practice and as an imperial program, it just didn't. Of course, there were executions of leaders, but that's what Rome did with nonviolent resistance. It always picked off the leader. But if, if you were a armed rebel that crucified you and as many of your top lieutenants as you could arrest in a, in a nice long row, that's the way Rome did violence. So the very fact that Pilate executed Jesus but didn't round up his 11 followers, let us say, tells me that from the Roman point of view, they considered him a nonviolent resistor against Roman law and order. And therefore, from their point of view, Pilate was correct to execute him. And he would have been wrong had he executed his followers or in any of his followers. So the vision of the book of Revelation, I would describe as a lie about Rome and a libel about Christ. I mean, it's obvious if, if you read the, the Sermon on the Mount, what Christ says is that God does not, my God, let me put it positively, God sends the rain on the just and the unjust, and has the sun come up in the good and the bad. So God doesn't seem to, to pick on people then. That's not the way God runs the world, by punishments. Then why is he coming back with a sword? So it's, it's like a rejection of Christianity as I see it, really. At least a rejection of Jesus for a different type of Christ. And that's why I started the book by taking a very serious look at the book of Revelation, because that is probably the dominant book for many fundamentalist Christians. That's their justification. If yeah, you're, you know, when, when, uh, when I have discussions with people about issues of violence, right? And yeah. so, the justification for violence, if they can, if, if, if they're so bold as to try and justify violence inside of the Christian faith, it inevitably comes back to Revelation. Because yeah. that's the only place you can seem to find any, even if it's, even if you're having to read, you know, you're reading this apocalyptic literature that's full of symbolism. That's okay, fine. If you want to read that literally, that's the only place you're going to come up with any kind of violence that you can associate with Christ. 
And so to put that in better context, I, I really like that. That's the part of the book that I've really, um, I've had a chance to really peruse. And I've really appreciated your take on that. It's symbolic. You're quite right, but it's symbolic. I mean, you can use metaphorical or symbolic language to the war right. on somebody. We're, Absolutely. We're, we're going to bury you. We're, we're going to, to just, you know, flood you with fire. You, you can use symbolic right. language, but it's quite clear that they mean it as, as symbols of what they're going to do to you. Yeah. You, you can't say, well, Jesus has a sword in his mouth. <laughs> right. Well, well, not the best way to carry a sword, but even, but it's still, it's still a vision of slaughter. It really is. Right. Run it. Walk us through the, walk us through the process then of, of, you know, the, the mysterious 666 number that keeps coming, the mark of the beast and all that stuff that comes through. I, I thought your explanation of that was, was particularly helpful. Um, because it's been, you know, as a, as a Western Protestant evangelical kind of guy, we're wrapped up in this whole rapture thing. You know, everything's always two thousand. It's always it's always prophetic. It's always in the future. The beast of empire is going to be whoever the whoever our, our current really, enemy is, right? Yeah, so it's Russia or it's Iran or it's now it's going to be some. But but you had a very compelling argument, I thought, for who that specifically yeah, was. I'm pretty much following the consensus of scholarship there. For example, the beast is Rome because it, it it's it goes back to Daniel where all, all the the great empires are like beasts. They're not even like human beings. They're like beasts. And they're all, Rome is a conglomerate of all those beasts from Daniel. It's, it's like you could call it the super beast. Because what John wants to do, and we're, we're dealing with a real person, John of Patmos. To be fair, now remember, he's in exile on a Greek island. So this slaughtering Rome hasn't slaughtered him, for example. And in fact, the only one martyr who's mentioned by name in the entire book is executed. So, you know, there's there's no evidence beyond its repeated assertion that Rome has ever slaughtered as imperial practice and program. We just don't know it. In fact, I would even go so far as to say we know better because, for example, when Ignatius of Antioch is wandering towards Rome to be executed, when he's go- going through the same churches that John of Patmos is right to in Revelation. He never even mentions anything about persecution. The book of Revelation is a repudiation and rejection of the incarnation. That's what it is. It's like, get, Jesus, get rid of this idea of coming into Jerusalem on a peace donkey to put an end to war. Come back with a sword and slaughter those we don't like. That's, you know, that's a choice. You can decide that that's the way Jesus is, that the whole incarnation was a mistake and he, we need a second coming to fix it up. By all means, if that's your, I consider it counter Christianity. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind going so far to say that's the Antichrist. Right. No, I, <laughs> seems to be pretty much a, a repudiation of the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? But one I of mean, the other has to go. One, one or the other yeah. is right. Yeah. Can, one of the, so. You could say, well, I that. So what I, what I, what I seem to see as a pattern then as, a, as, as Rome descends or whatever into autocracy and correct me if I'm wrong, you're the, you're the historian. I'm just a lay person here. In, in the mythology of Rome, we get Romulus and Remus, um, who you, I think you, you classified that as a, as a, as a founding murder, right? Yeah. Yeah. So is Rome itself birthed out of violence or does that, and it, and does that violence grow as they descend more towards autocracy or has that always been part of the program? Well, that's what Horace asked in the first century when he was in the middle of this great civil war we were talking about. He said, are we accursed? Are we a nation accursed by the fact that our, we were founded on two heroes, one killing the other? I suppose we might ask that of what happened when we came here. We had no two heroes who killed one another, but those who came in a way killed those who were here. The, the Native Americans, it was, it was founded even apart from the, the problem of disease and bringing diseases that were unknown, it ended up almost in an, in an inaugural death camp almost here. We, even if, even if we had never, ever, 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 you know, fought against anyone, we, millions would have been killed simply by the Germans we brought from Europe. So it's a tragic, it's a tragic situation. That would be our Romulus and Ramus, if you will. 
integral thing. But the interesting thing is, in the same way that in the book of Revelation, we have Christians, at least the writer at least, who is in effect talking against Rome by making Christ an imperial Roman, as it were. He's coming back to do to Rome what Rome had done to conquer to the conquering people. He, he, he's just like a Roman. He comes on a horse, not a donkey. He has a sword. He looks remarkably like a Roman general, actually. Well, that means that these Christians, in a way, even though they're absolutely criticizing the Roman Empire, have accepted the Roman vision of how they're on the world. Wow. You do it with a sword. And if you don't obey, we'll, we'll kill you. And the only, yeah. the only good Romans will be dead Romans. So right. in a way, we have a parallel with Christian fundamentalists insofar as they're going over to support American imperialism and autocracy. And that, in a way, is more dismaying, the speed with which I thought good people in this country looked at autocracy and an autocrat and really liked it. Yeah. Yes. yeah. You have to join the, yeah, the Pax Romana is a great big <laughs> delusion. It is peaceful within the parameters. The, the Roman system was to put the troops on ba- in, in bases all around the periphery of the empire, see on the Rhine, the Danube, the Euphrates. And then we're inside that perimeter, everything was peaceful. You didn't see legionaries marching the streets of Ephesus or Alexandria and beating up people. You probably never saw them. They were on the periphery. But on that periphery, of course, the Pax Romana looked very different <laughs> if you were a German on the east side of the Rhine. The Pax Romana didn't look quite the same to you. <laughs> yeah, you were the one being crushed under the wheels as they rolled over you. And so that founding murder, though, thing seems to be a pattern. I see that with Cain and Abel. Cain and you know, Abel there's that, you know, so I don't know which, which of those precedes the other as far as chronologically, but I, I know that Rene Girard talked a great deal about civilization. It, it, anyway, whatever our concept of that is being always founded on, on violence or murder. I mean, that just seems to be the pattern of, of, of humanity, right? And if you could say, well, that's just the way it is, you know, it's like bad weather, get over it, stop whining about it. Just it's, it's natural. The trouble is, as we know now with regard to weather, if I could use that, there's also such a thing as climate change. Yeah. And if you accelerate climate change to a certain degree, we can't keep up with it and it can destroy us. And you have exactly the same pattern with war. If you were to say, well, there's war in the first centuries, it's, there's always been war. It's natural. No, it's not. It's cultural. There is absolutely no reason why our species, Homo sapiens, could not agree that war, war could destroy us, just the same as climate acceleration could destroy us, and therefore we're going to do something about it. Not the slightest reason. In general, despite everything, we have been able to stop Florida going to war with Georgia. <laughs> right. In, in general. <laughs> in general. <Yeah. laughs> might go war to war with Disney, but you know, it hasn't taken on. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't taken on. I think it'll lose that for two, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Don't fight the mouse. Anyway, <laughs> you know, in, in general, so far, and I, I mean so far. Yeah, so far. I really mean so far. We've been able to hold together the unity of the states without ever going to war with one another. And I'm not trying to be cynical when I say I, I, I really mean so far. I mean, because you've almost separated once. But. So why could that not happen to the world? Well, obviously, we can't. We, we can learn, 80,000 people can learn to empty a stadium without anyone pushing. Right, exactly. We, do it. we can learn to walk down the street, crowded street, very crowded, without pushing or without saying, move it. We, you know, we get into a car and all of a sudden we're less human. I mean, if I see an older person going down the street, going very slowly and really holding me up, I just get around and I won't, you know, do anything rude when I pass. So we can, 
we are not naturally violent. We're culturally violent. And if it's taken for granted that this is normal and we have wars and it's too bad, and they do tend to get worse than the preceding one. And we're watching one now on, on television as our evening entertainment, which is something new. Um, that's just the way it is. I, I don't think that trajectory for our species looks good to me. And that's why the last part of the book brings up this whole discussion on the invention of nonviolent resistance, not by Jesus, but by his fellow Jews in the first century, in between their experience of fighting the Romans in 4 BCE, when the Romans crucified 2,000 people in Jerusalem, and again in 66, when they crucified 500 a day till they ran out of trees. In that interval, there were experimental, there were experiments with programmatic, organized, nonviolent resistance. Mm. Exactly what you tend to find between wars, not, not, not during a war, but after war. It's within that matrix that I put Jesus. He is a Jew who is advocating nonviolent resistance, not, not just pacifism, but nonviolent resistance against Roman law and order. That is why he was crucified. From the Roman point of view, it was a right decision. From the Roman point of view. Well, and wasn't it, wasn't it Borg? Wasn't it Marcus Borg that, that, that talked about, he explained some of the things that Jesus said in terms of nonviolent resistance, right? Of the whole, you know, of walking course. the extra mile and turning the other cheek was not simply laying down and being doormats for your enemy. It was a way to turn the tables on them somewhat and be creatively resistant, yeah, um, exactly. nonviolently, right? It's not original to say Jesus was not. Uh, I, there are a lot of scholars I noticed who talk about his nonviolent nonviolence. Now, right. Rome, Rome loved nonviolence. Rome did, sure, Rome they were fine with that. For nonviolence, they did crucify you for nonviolent resistance. Crucify the leader. That's the way Rome uh, operated by civil law with the leader. So, if I only had Pilate, I would know that that right. he was crucified as a nonviolent resistor. And the question that, the, the deep question of the book, you know, if somebody were to say to me, well, I could, don't care about Caesar and I don't even believe in God. So I'm, and the Bible, I'm not interested in any of that stuff you're talking about. I would say, okay, okay, could we bracket it for a minute? Our species, Homo sapiens, it's a lovely oxymoron, by the way, wise Homo, left. <laughs> Yeah, it is really, you know, we call ourselves the wise homo. We, we left Africa 70,000 years ago, our species. I'm just talking about us. 70,000 years ago. And I think it's a fair description to say we declared war on the world. We declare war on the physical world, and it's now come due as climate, as we know, climate problem. We declared war on the physical world, like on the animal world, sorry, which now gives us all the endangered species. And we really declared war on the human world. We invented war. Now, all of that only becomes really lethal because of the escalation. If all of that had stayed at a low level, then we would not be talking about our ability to destroy the planet, our ability to destroy its livability. So I, I think we have to face that it's not just an ethical problem or a moral or a Christian or a biblical problem. We have an evolutionary problem, the viability and sustainability of our species. And that's really the question I want to ask, to be honest with you. And, I mean, is there, I mean, we can see this time and time again, right? Jesus is uh, executed for being a nonviolent resistor, nonviolence resistor. And then we see it again with Gandhi. We see it again with Martin Luther King, right? We see this time. I mean, as can, can we as a species stop killing the nonviolent resistor? I mean, is that even within our nature? Or are we just doomed? Well, I'm certain, <laughs> I'm doomed. certain it's within our nature. I'm not certain it's within our culture. I think that is, that is the problem without any melodrama or apocalyptic, you know, delusions. The serious problem we have to ask ourselves really is our viability as a species. When we ask it of many other species, 
You can have a glorious species like the saber-toothed tiger, which is now defunct as far as I know. So we, we're asking the more serious question. And I want to insist it's not just an ethical or a Christian, a moral or a religious question. We're talking about the viability of our species, the sustainability of our species, whether we are the most <laughs> endangered species of them all, self-endangered. That's, that's what I began the book by saying Horace said to the Roman Empire, nobody could destroy us but ourselves. We're going to do it to ourselves. Right. Yeah. And yeah. maybe that's the same, you know, we have to say about our species. Right. Didn't they say, you know, that it, if, if, if Rome ever died, it would have been an assisted suicide, right? Is that, I read that in your book as well. Um, I can't remember who said it, but regardless, that, that, that's, but that's, isn't it interesting how myopic we are, you know, that, that, we we find ourselves in the same place of thinking, well, no, we're America. I mean, we're, we're, we're solid. We're good. You know, we're, we're, we're going to be here. You know, we'll be the first empire to survive. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and, and yet you, as you've outlined in the book, and I, I, yeah, I think you've drawn some very good parallels. I, they're impossible to not see if you're looking. Yeah. I mean, you could argue, uh, you're quite right. We could argue we are the, the first one that breaks, breaks the, the, the trajectory, but, the total, what bothers me is every other one said the same thing. Exactly, <laughs> right. It's well, not, and the parallels are there, right? I mean, you can see the trajectory is going the same direction, right? They all said God is on our side, or the gods are on our side. Or sure. Jesus on our side, or Asher is on our side. They all had gods on their sides. They all were convinced they would last forever. And if you, you know, if you want to really be serious, what brings the empire, what has bring all empires down so far? People say, oh, it's pride. I, I don't think it's pride. Well, if they extend it too far, I don't see that. I think actually that evolution, by that I mean cosmic evolution, and the big bang doing its bang thing, is not on the side of injustice. Hmm. I mean, that might sound like a weird thing, because the Bible always talks about God not being on the side of injustice. Let's leave that aside for a moment. It seems to me evolution is absolutely fair to everything, including, unfortunately, you know, viruses and things I don't want it to be fair to. Right. But yet everyone is given a fair possibility. If, if we're, we have intelligence and we're free to spend our money on whatever we want, and if we do it on preparing ourselves against viruses, that's one thing. If we don't do it, then the viruses will chortle and, and thrive. So I think there is a, a law of evolution on the side of fairness and injustice. And that's why I think empires don't last. They, they get their, their time in the sun, but eventually the weight of injustice that they are fomenting cannot crack with evolution. Uh, I, I really not using that as a way of really bringing in ethical. I think ethics, morality, and religion, including Christianity, are only valid insofar as it track with evolution. Yeah. Wow. That's a far more important trajectory, I think. So that's the way I would really see it. I, I, I don't want this to be a, just an ethical decision. Because it, it's never worked when we tried to formulate it as that. The question is whether we are a sustainable species. Wow, my mind. I'm sorry, my mind is kind of going. Yeah, you've blown. You've blown my mind. I, I I hadn't thought about that before. And as as usual, whenever I I read stuff that you've written, or I'm, I was certain that when we talked, there would be things that I'm like, what? <laughs> That's amazing. One of the things that that strikes me then too is then is your bringing to bear sort of historical discipline into the study of Jesus, into the study of, you know, talk to me about that. Was that, was that something that was maybe the result of, of you leaving the priesthood? You said that they had given you all kinds of tools to be a scholar and, and to look at things that way. Um, so is that sort of the inevitable result of the training you got in, in seminary and, and in, you know, in monasteries as well? Well, it was, but once again, let me begin it way back in that boarding school when I, when I got to read, you know, Greek and Latin classics long before I ever got to Greek. I had five years of that stuff, as I told you. Then I went into a monastery. Every day we spent three or four hours chanting the Psalms in Latin. I, I, 
I was quite at home in Latin. I, I'd learned Cicero, you know, and I was smart enough not to tell my novice master my first year that, you know, these Psalms are kind of a crude Latin. It's, it's really not Ciceronian Latin. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> And when I first ran into the New Testament, um, I, I was also smart not to tell the priests who were training me in the monastery, but you know, this Greek is kind of pretty ordinary stuff <laughs> if you really had Homer when you were 13 or 14. So I had all of that stuff. Now, I got an absolutely magnificent education because I was in, <laughs> I was in, after I got my doctorate, I was sent to Rome for two years. I was 59 to 61. I was all over Europe even into East Berlin in those two years. You could travel in the everywhere. Then they sent me for two more years of a diploma in archaeology to Jerusalem. That was um, Jordanian Jerusalem. That was before the war of 67, 65 to 67, I was there. I left the day before the war. I, technically, I ran. That's, that's yeah, absolutely. You know, fled. And we were told, get out. Anyway, and again, all over the Middle East, everywhere. You could travel freely in those days, of course, before the war. Everywhere you could think of. I set out to see every site that was worth seeing. So I had a magnificent education on site, not in the classroom. (laughs) In the classroom, yes, but especially on site. So I knew all of that. Now, what what created the problem was nothing to do with the Bible. It was the Pope's encyclical Humanae Vitae in maybe August of 68 that said basically it was a mortal sin for Catholics to perform any form of birth control except rhythm or abstinence. I was asked to go on television with a medical doctor who was going to argue that rhythm worked. Um, I was going to say what I thought, and I said, Pope was wrong. I said, I said it was kind of very simple. If, you know, Nixon is our president, but he's wrong about Vietnam, and the Pope is our Pope, but he's wrong about birth control. <laughs> I thought it was love. I thought it really annoyed everyone. So one week later, my superiors get a letter from the Cardinal Archbishop, show cause within one week why Crossan shouldn't be fired from the, the diocese. And immediately what my superiors did in the order, they defended me. They wrote a letter back to the Cardinal that I got a copy of, which could have got them fired too saying things like, well, you know, in the Bible, you should talk to the person directly. You, sh- you shouldn't talk to me about him. <laughs> right. And we've trained Cross and he's acting according to his, to his conscience. And what can we... Anyway, I decided at that point, okay, okay, this is not going to work. I, I'm out of here. So as I told you, I applied for a dispensation. And within a couple of months, I was gone and teaching at DePaul University. So no, I, I honestly don't think in any way that changed my understanding of the Bible or anything to do with it. It changed my understanding of Roman Catholicism and the papal authority (laughs) and what you can and can't say. But that did not touch at all my understanding of the Bible. That had been, the, the, the genes for that had been set years before. Well, but then that, that impetus then to bring that, that, that scholastic you know, intensity to your study of Jesus, I think was something that was unique. The Jesus seminar, I think, was something very unique. It, it was. Let me go back to that. Because when I left the seminary to teach at DePaul, immediately people said, well, what's your research project? I said, well, my research project was doing whatever I was told to do. <laughs> right. <know? laughs> so they said, well, in the university, you have to have your own research project. So I had been teaching a course on the parables of Jesus. And so I thought, well, then, I'm going to write on the historical Jesus, the Jesus of the parables, not the parable in Mark or Matthew or Luke, you know, but the Jesus who had told the parables. So that's how I got into the historical Jesus. So the first book in 1973 was called In Parables, The Challenge of the Historical Jesus. Okay. That was in 73, by the way, where very few people were doing historical Jesus research. The, the general view was you can't know anything about him. Can't know anything about him. So even choosing that was was kind of unusual. So from 73 to what, to 85, I'd been working steadily on the historical Jesus before the Jesus Seminar started. I would have been doing that if the Jesus Seminar had never happened. And then my own 
big conclusion to that was the historical Jesus, the life of a Mediterranean Jewish peasant, came out in 71, in the fall of 71. Kind of right in the middle of the Jesus seminar. That's amazing. Um, that was one of the things that, that, that as a young college student myself, you know, when I first ran across this kind of research that, that struck me as, you know, again, it, it forced me to come to terms with some, some things that I had been raised up in and it challenged a bunch of my assumptions, was not comfortable that process, but, but it was so necessary, you know, and, and, you know, it, it took some time to appreciate the impact, but that's kind of influenced the way that I've approached things from that point forward is, okay, I want to, you know, I want to be um, as objective as possible about some of this and try and, I guess, reintroduce some, some reason into, into some of these, these yeah. arguments. But, yeah. If you're thinking, we were talking before about reason and revelation, two sides of yeah. the world, mm-hmm. you could say history and faith was the same thing because it was, it's kind of common sense for me. If you want to understand anything, anything that's happened, you have to put it into its historical matrix. I, I don't know how to do it in the other way. If I want, if you want to say, why did President X do something? I'm not going to say, well, he just had a bad breakfast that morning or, you know, he <laughs> didn't get a good right, night. Right. You, you <laughs> try and put it into its historical matrix and say, okay, that doesn't explain it. But it makes sense of why it happened and why people, I mean, you could put it this way. No historical matrix explains a Jesus, say, or a Martin Luther King, but it explains why people are ready to listen. Mm. Okay. You know, you, 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 you can't say, well, why was Jesus the one and not his, not his, one of his brothers or James or somebody else? Why Jesus? Well, we have no answer to that question. What we can explain is why at that point of time, in that place, People were ready to listen. Otherwise, we wouldn't even know about a Jesus. We have to recognize that the time and place are equally important. You can't say, why didn't Martin Luther King happen, happen 20 years earlier? Because if he did, he would have been lynched the first time he opened his mouth. So the same with Jesus. If he had happened 30 years before, say when Herod the Great was taking over control of the Jewish homeland, we wouldn't be hearing about him. He wouldn't have lived long enough to say a second sentence or make a second parable. And if he'd lived 30 years later in the middle of the Great War with Rome of 66 to 74, I doubt if we'd heard of him either. So there's windows of opportunity, as it were. And Jesus was in one of them. For me, that I mean, that makes so much sense because... Um... I mean, without going into stuff that our listeners have heard from me multiple times where I, you know, I left, I left the Christian faith years ago, but I never left this idea that Jesus was an important person. And that if I was to listen to what Jesus was saying and asking of me to do or us to do, that I could still live a life that was important. And, um, so the historical Jesus, you know, I kind of, inadvertently, without even knowing, you know, without sounding rude, without even knowing who you are or were at the time, um, I was kind of going down that road anyway of this, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to tear apart and tear down everything mystical, mythical, you know, all of that miracles. And at the basis of this gentleman or this person, this, this Jewish person under the Roman law, can I still follow that guy? Do I still get something from him that tells me how to be a better person to the, the, my fellow humans. And I had to, I had to say yes, that you know, I could still, I could still find something within Jesus that told me how to be a better person towards the people around me. And I just, it, it, it's disheartening to see how the American evangelical church has weaponized Jesus so much and, and it seems to have lost sight of what the true message was or is. I, I hate, I hate, I hate sounding so doomsday, but I, I am just so, I am so worried that we, that we can't get back to that. And I don't know, I, I, I don't know if you have an answer or some idea of, you know, how do we get back to that message? Well, look, the only thing I, I have very good friends who tell me, you know, you're wasting your time. 
you're just turning out of all of this stuff and it's useless and it's and I have a very simple answer. I said, my job is simply to tell the truth. I see it. This is the way I see it. If it affects people, I would hope it does. I really hope it does. Because I, do, I think like you, I think this has to do with the world and the future of our species, not just with people being nice or something like that. But the only thing you can say is, all you have to do is tell the truth. I've spent my life in the Bible. It's what I do <laughs> every day um, and have been doing it for 19 years. And so I'm going to tell you what I see. You then are going to have to decide if that sounds valid to you or not. Or if that even sounds interesting to even be, begin with you. But my, my responsibility as a scholar is really no more than to tell the truth as I see it. I don't mean that, I really don't mean that means I don't care. I do not mean that. But my primary thing is not, is to see what I can see as a scholar and tell. If I spend my time, for example, in reading all the texts I can that are contemporary with Jesus, which I do, Roman, Greek, Hebrew, whatever, visiting all the sites, which I've pretty much done, visiting the museums to see the remnants and the artifacts left over, until you get a, you get a feel for the place. And then you read, <laughs> then you read the text against that fully fleshed out background, fully, fully embodied matrix. That's when you see it. Because if somebody says to me, well, who the heck are you 2000 years later to think you're better than any of these people? You're not. It's simply that you have a wider matrix than was available to them. We're in the same position for somebody looking at us if we're still around 2,000 years from now. I'm probably saying something like, couldn't this see what was coming? Wasn't it obvious to them? So I never feel, I never look down at the past, even when somebody is doing something I think is really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that I'm doing it now and we're doing it now for somebody Except I don't think it'll be 2,000 years. I think it might be just two or three. So that we know, why did they do that? Couldn't they see what would happen if they did that? So history becomes then something spiritual for me. I mean, I do get people saying to me, and I, I sense they're disappointed, but, but you're not, but you're doing all this history stuff. It's not spiritual. Really, I get that. Or even if I talk about Jesus' nonviolent resistance, I get from people, good people I'm talking about now, who agree with me, basically. But, but you've taken all the spirituality out of it. And I know what they mean by spirituality is, some, is something kind of bang, flash, mystical, or something like that. But I can't imagine anything more mystical than evolution. I have friends who tell me, and my friend Marcus Borg would tell me, that he had experience, a spiritual experience in which he was kind of one with the universe. And I, but Marcus, it doesn't make any difference whether you've had one or not. You are. It really doesn't make any difference. It may be nice to have had it, but you're embedded in evolution and we all are embedded in evolution. And the fact that we happen to know about it now and we didn't know about it <laughs> in most of our evolution didn't make any difference. We still were. The fact that we know about gravity and have a name for it didn't make any difference. The <laughs> first person who, who met a precipice and kept going learned that. <laughs> <laughs> like the, like the road runner. Remember the road runner? Yeah, yeah. yeah. the road runner. Like, and he, <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, he might not have understood what to call it, but he sure understood its effects. Yes. yes. And uh, I, I, I agree with you. I, I you know, I just, I, I find something very, comforting and very spiritual about that, about history and about, you know, that approach to everything. And, and what has, you know, one of those things that I've pushed against and I'm still, I'm still a pastor. I still have a, you know, I still pastor a very small church here in Texas. Um, and one of the things that I try very hard to impress upon the people that come to church with me is that, is that context matters, that history matters that we we cannot afford to to take these little snippets of scripture like we tend to do and and 
pull them from their context and pull them from their culture and then try to, you know, anachronistically utilize them to push an agenda that is very 21st century, not first century. And so we've been on a steep learning curve trying to figure out, okay, what is, and you know, and I'm, and I'm, I'm a self-described layman, you know, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a scholar. Um, but I read a lot and I try to read guys who are very smart like you and to get some perspective. And, and you're, I, I think you're right in, in that there seems to be more people who are, li- who are willing to listen to that than there might have been for me anyway, personally, 10 or 15 years ago. I think that, I think people are willing to, to step out a little bit more and embrace that. I'm, I'm hoping in a way because. Yeah, I'm still writing, and the only purpose of, of writing this book, Render to Caesar, you know, I, I sent in the proposal to Harper, my editors, in the fall of 2018. It went into them finished, except for, you know, the things you can tinker with in the, in, in the prologue or the epilogue, in 2020. So all of what's happened in the last weeks here, the last couple of months, in Ukraine, none of that was on the horizon. I didn't even know who was going to be the next president. I really didn't. When the, when the book was basically written. So the fact that it, it rings bells that make sense today has to be, has to be not that I, that I'm brilliantly prophetic, but I'm plugged into something that is brilliantly pro- prophetic. And that is the biblical tradition, not just this little verse taken out of context that tells me about this, but the whole trajectory of God and empire, for example, of what happened to the Roman Empire. All of that are patterns of humanity that I think repeat themselves. Yeah. Tragically. No, yeah. No, I think you're right. And as I, I had that same sense as I was reading through, you know, the first little, the, the, the first parts of that book is, is, um, man, this is so relevant. You know, this is, and it will, and it, sadly, I, you know, the, the pessimistic side of me says it will be relevant in a hundred years. It'll be, re- you know, it's, it's because we haven't figured out yet how to break these patterns or even sometimes to recognize the patterns that we're in. And that strikes me as sad, but that's why guys like you are so important. So we appreciate that. I hope most people get the book. I mean, it's, it, it's going to require a little work to read through it. I know that. I never make anything more difficult than I can, actually. And it, it, a book like that is written and rewritten and rewritten about four basic times. I mean, completely through. Read job to make it as clear as possible. Not simpler, because some of this can't be made any simpler. Something like the book of Revelation was written not to be simple, but to batter you with, with images, like, like a giant strobe light. It's strobing you. It, it, its message is terribly simple, but it batters you with it again and again with symbols, symbols, symbols. Seven this, seven that, seven the other. Until you kind of go back and say, I give up, I give up. Beating you into submission, right? <laughs> because that, that's the way it works. And if you try to read it straight through as a nice, coherent story, like Mark's Gospel, it doesn't work like that. It just... Hits you with the same thing over and over, like it's strobing you. If that's a, I don't know if that's a verb or not. Or you've been strobed into submission. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> John, you, I'm blind. I, I can no longer see. I love it, John. There's a, there's a title for the podcast: "Strobed into Submission." <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but it, but you're right. It is barrage of images, isn't it? But I, I'm gonna. You know, I was just gonna echo what you said, and it's like, yeah, it it. it it might be a hard read for some people, but uh, a phrase that's been coming up in our on this podcast a lot of uh, quite a few times now is this 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 idea of intellectual honesty, and we need to be intellectually honest with ourselves, and that means sometimes reading stuff that challenges us, that makes us really look at the evolutionary path our species is on, and you know it's and it, and it really does look like if we don't figure some stuff out that yeah we're gonna we're gonna just kill ourselves off uh and this planet you know i think it's george carlin uh the comedian who uh, makes a joke about how you know these big you know people holding up the signs that save the planet save the planet is like well the planet's still gonna be here the planet will figure itself out 
We may not be. You might, you might want to hold up a sign that says, save the humans, because we, we might not be here. But it's books like yours that give us, you know, this, this look into a historical path that maybe, maybe somehow we can, we can break the cycle of violence and empire. Yeah, but empire being but, born of violence. But don't you think it's interesting, John, too? We just had an interview right before yours with, um, with a lady who wrote a book about climate change. And I'm seeing the whole time we're talking, I'm, 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 that's the parallel that I'm seeing is, is, is you, uh, is you're ringing similar bells. You know, yours, yours is, is, you know, this sort sort of concept of empire and violence and things like that. And hers is, Hey, we're just abusing the planet and we're just creating a climate catastrophe and crisis that's going to come. And so what, what you just said is exactly what she just said, by the way, which was I, my job here is to tell the truth. My job is to, as a scientist, you would say as a historian, my job is to come as objectively as possible to this data and, 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 and pretty much arrive at a conclusion that is true and then let the chips fall where they may, right? Um, I don't do. have an agenda here except the truth. So I think that's really interesting. You get otherwise kind of delusional that you're, you're a mess, messianic, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. But the, the parallel, it's the escalatory nature again. Yeah. If, well, if and that's interesting, yeah. Thing, and, you know, but we, we'd be able to adjust. We, we, our species would always be able to adjust because stuff goes slowly. Now, if we start accelerating stuff, we can accelerate climate change to the point we can't keep up. You know, we, we can't. If the water rises, you know, we just can't do it. So I find three things, say the physical world, climate, the animal world, let me use that term, the feral world, dangerous species, and then the human world, war. These are the three escalations that threaten us. And it's, it's escalatory nature that bothers me. Otherwise, you could say, well, we've always had this, you know, we've always had bad weather, so get over it. It's, you know, it's, no, you've always had fires, but not if you have more fires, you know, wildfires, I'm talking about. We've always had the water rise, but escal- escalation is the danger. Yeah, that was interestingly enough. That's so weird that that's. I don't know if you noticed that, John, but that that was exactly the conversation we had with with our climate change scientists. Was like, you know, this is what this is the issue is the acceleration of all these issues. Oh, There's exactly. always been fluctuations in. Yes. You know, she's studying in particular permafrost, and she's she's studying you know um, the methane the, emissions, yeah, the methane from, emissions from permafrost degradation and all this other stuff. And she's like, listen, there's a process that is natural. You know, it's not an either or, it's not man-made or it's this, it's both. But as, as, but as human intervention increases, um, what you have is exactly what you just described, which is an acceleration or a, a, of a process that we can no longer adapt to and keep up with. It becomes cataclysmic at some point. Species will be the same. We always lost species. That's part sure. of it. Right. It's the escalation of the ones and the ones which are more or less important for our survival. So. I, I've been using, I've been hyphenating the word escalatory violence. So I'm, I don't want to use the word violence, but escalatory violence. Because I think that's the word that threatens us. It's, it's the speed of escalation. Because if you draw a draft, it's going to go like that. Yeah. And it's going to get to a point where it's just unsustainable, right? I mean, not, I mean, obviously as, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, I would say nonviolence is my, is my utopian goal. But as a pragmatist, I would say, like, I would agree with you that it just gets to a point where that violence is beyond anyone's ability to contain. It just becomes, an, a, you know, Gerard would call it a contagion, right? That would say it's just, it, it becomes infectious and it, it's almost, um, anyway, we're, it's exponential in its growth. Yes, exponential. Right. The, the, word, so. the analogy I've used myself is that, that it's, it's the drug of choice of our species. Violence. Yeah. No, I think and, you're right. And you have to think of it as an addiction. That to get rid of an addiction is terribly difficult. <laughs> I mean, imagine trying to get control of violence. Now, all the, all the good people are involved in making ammunition and making arms. And when you want to send them to the Ukrainians, and isn't that a good thing to do? And how can we not do it? And don't we need to make more and better arms? I mean, it's almost impossible not to end up saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, we're just putting more and more violence out there. That becomes escalatory, as you said. And so I tell you what, Mr. Croson, Dom, 
Crossan, I should say. I'm sorry. I'm trying to articulate how much I've enjoyed this conversation and I'm having a hard time finding words. Uh, just it is, it's been great. It's been enlightening. If you, um, I'll address the audience for a second. If you have not had the chance to read, um, this man's work, uh, first of all, you're in for a treat because you've got, I don't need dozens of books to catch up on. So you've got, <laughs> so there's a, there's a plethora of work to dive into. Um, but you've just been missing out on a, on, I think, I think on a critical piece of your theological studies and your growth. I think anyway, so for that, I thank you for making the time. Um, the new book render to Caesar is out and available wherever books are sold. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm ending a game show. That was available wherever <laughs> books are sold and you're fine bookstores everywhere. Um, I don't want to say the name of the big one, but y'all know where you can get it. Yeah. It's a, uh, so far, like I said, it's a, it's a great read. It's, 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 it's a, it's a dense book. There's a lot of material there. Um, it is worth reading more than once, I think. But uh, anyway, Dom, thank you very, very, very much for your time. And thank you both. It's always a pleasure to be with you anytime. Uh, well, we may reach out to you again because I think we just scratched the surface. So maybe a month or two down the road, we might reach out again and see if we can continue Absolutely. the conversation. I would love it. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. Thank you for listening to This Is Not Church. Be sure to rate and review the podcast on your platform of choice. If you would like to partner with us, visit patreon.com slash this is not church, where you will receive exclusive content such as early access to episodes, videos of upcoming episodes, and live Q&A sessions. Be sure to check out our Facebook group or follow us on Twitter and Instagram. All the links are in the show notes. We'll be back soon with another episode.